What is the most amazing place that you have ever stood? We all have so many different experiences. We probably have a lot of different answers. Maybe, maybe it was that battlefield. Maybe it was a battlefield like Gettysburg where you stood on one side next to the statue where the one side stood. Looked across the field where you could see the statue or where the other army stood. At a place where thousands lost their lives. Maybe it was on the top of one of our wonderful, beautiful mountains. Whether you drove up there or hiked up there, where you just looked over the expanse of God's creation and just, just so moved. So awesome. Or maybe it was standing in front of that really large hole. You know, that, that canyon that we call Grand. And looked again at seeing God's beauty. His power. Maybe it was standing up by the altar and turning and watching her walk down the aisle. Maybe it was in that delivery room. <clears throat> when we first got to see that, that gift that God gives you welcome into this world. So many things that we maybe stand in awe. It's just we stand in these places and we're just so moved that we can't help but share. To tell of our experience, to tell of that moment. That's what we see from Isaiah this man. He saw something that there were pretty few human beings, in fact, not many at all, truly got to see. We find him in the temple. We don't know for sure if it was the Jerusalem temple. It, it really doesn't seem like it would be that Jerusalem temple just based on the fact that there was a throne there. But that's neither here nor there. But here we see an amazing sight. One that Isaiah couldn't help but share with us as he saw at this gorgeous throne a robe that filled the entire temple, and even saw those, those seraphim, those fiery angels with their six wings. Something truly amazing. And if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough to tell you how amazing this place, this visual was, then we hear the words of those seraphim. The seraphim themselves, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. And, and when this was said, this wasn't just some calming, soothing, heart playing song. What, what are we told? The, the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. The temple was filled with smoke. I mean, this was a party, if you might to say. This was so loud that people were probably calling the cops in order to have a noise complaint. This was loud. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It, it's like when a lightning bolt hits a little bit closer than we're comfortable with, and the whole house shakes. It's like when the train comes by blaring its horn. The entire way from Benson all the way through Vail. It is like the sound of an earth. And the earth is shook. <clears throat> Claiming exactly who this God is. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the Lord of armies. This is who our triune God is. Our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is perfect. He is holy. And because of that, there is a separation. Because He is holy, there is a separation or a canyon between God and the rest of His creation. Even those sinless angels, those seraphim who are with Him, they showed their humility, covering their eyes, covering their feet as they were flying and carrying out God's See, God is holy. 
And we are you know, we, we like to believe that we are really chummy with God, but our, our, our understanding, His holiness, is not something that we can be chummy with. Because God's holiness, it, it's not like a glass of water, because a glass of water with just a little bit of ink in it ruins the entire glass. That's not God. God is holiness. It's more like an antibiotic, one that completely attacks the virus, that attacks the disease, and, and destroys it. And if we're the disease, because of our sin and our sinful nature, we can't stand before God's holiness. And so you can understand Isaiah's response. He proclaims, Woe to me! I am doomed! I am, I am ruined! Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of Armies, I am here in the presence of the Holy One, and of the Lord Almighty, and, and I, I should not be here. I'm doomed. I am ruined. Woe to me. See, there's a problem here. Isaiah has a problem, and actually God has a problem too. So, I mean, God has a problem too. Bear with me. God's problem is he's got this wonderful message that needs to go on. But the material that he has to work with leaves something to be desired. He's like a businessman with no qualified candidates to fill the job. And that's Isaiah's problem. Same problem that you and I have. Isaiah is, is the problem because here he is standing before the Holy God. He should not be there. Woe to me, Lord, I, I am ruined. It's the same struggle that Jesus actually had when trying to find those who were going to carry out and be his messengers, be his witnesses. Think of Peter sitting in, in the boat after Jesus, who had risen from the dead, had given the wonderful gift of this miraculous catch of fish, and now Peter is bows before Jesus and get away from me. I can't stand in your presence. Where is Jesus going to go? He's in the boat in the middle of the sea. And yet you understand the problem. I can't be that messenger. I can't be that, that oh, because I'm not holy. Because I am ruined. Because I am sinful. This is the problem that I, Isaiah was at. But notice what is God's response? See, God, God doesn't say, well, sorry, sorry, Isaiah, I didn't mean to bring you here. You're, you're right, you're right, I, you know, you're, you don't qualify, so, so well, you're all. He, he doesn't even say, oh, no, 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 your, your fear is a little over-exaggerated, no, you don't have to, he doesn't say that, he, he doesn't say that sin is, is, is not, it's not serious. No, he says you're right to be afraid. But you know that problem that you have? That problem that separates you and me? I'll take care of it. I'll take care of that somehow. And the visual that, that Isaiah gets? A seraphim flew to me, carrying a glowing coal in his hand. Which he had taken from the altar with tongs. Now you know that, that altar, the one with, with the burnt offerings on it. And so when this coal is blowing, have you ever seen a blowing coal? That's hot. It's going to leave a mark. It's going to hurt. And you know what does the seraphim do with it? He takes the blowing coal from the altar with tongs, touched my mouth with the coal, and said, Look, this has touched your lips, so your guilt is taken away and your sin is forgiven. How scary is that? A six-winged seraphim, a, a fiery host, an angel of God, comes flying to you carrying a glowing piece of coal. This is going to hurt. And yet it doesn't. In fact, it takes away the it takes away the hurt and marks 
can't answer that. But it's what he chose to do. And it's what needed to happen. And what, it's what needs to happen in order for other people to hear about Jesus, for other people to know and believe about Jesus. Paul puts it so clearly. The people need to share this good news. He says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How, then, can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Someone needs to talk about Jesus. Someone needs to share this good news so that others can hear about Jesus, so that others can come to faith, so that others can believe through the power of the Holy Spirit to grow and strengthen faith. And so that's where God asks the question, who will go for us? Who shall I send? And because of the forgiveness, the first one racing to be from the line that recruitment, Isaiah, you're mine. Send, send me. The prophet who just moments before was standing in fear. Now, because of the forgiveness, is the one who wants to go and share. There are many who are moved. To do this, share. Ones who, who heed the call and, and go and devote their lives to, to the public ministry. Many of which are still continuing their studies, as they were called as vicars. Many men who were called to serve as pastors. Men and women called to serve as teachers. But not everybody is called to the public ministry. Yet not everyone takes up the full-time work like Isaiah and like Peter the Apostles, like those who graduate from MLC and, and our seminary. And yet this call is also for for you, for you who are sitting in the pew. If you would ask people, humanly speaking, who is the most influential or important when it came to your faith and getting to know Jesus, the surveys are very clear. It's only about 5% that will point at the pastor. Think about that for a moment. It's only about 5% of Christians who's most influential when it comes to their spiritual welfare, humanly speaking, was the pastor. That means it was the parents, the grandparents, the aunts and uncles, the family members, it was the friends, it was the co workers. moved by the forgiveness that God has given you. Here am I. <clears throat> because there are those out there who need to hear. How can they believe if they have not heard? So God is saying with the gift of that forgiveness with this wonderful joy. Knowing what we need to know, knowing what they need to know. And we proclaim with those angels, sharing this good news. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of your will.